Welcome to the Homeschool Mama Self-Care Podcast. If you are a homeschool mama challenged by doubt, not sure if you can do this homeschool thing, if you are a homeschool mama challenged by overwhelm, there are just too many things to do, or if you are a homeschool mama looking for connection and encouragement, then this is the podcast for you. I'm Teresa Wiedrich from CapturingTheCharmedLife.com, and I'm here to encourage you in your homeschool journey. So let's turn our homeschool challenges into our homeschool charms. Today, I get to introduce you to Nike Anderson. Nike is a mommy blogger at the Homeschool Genius, where she shares her passion for all things homeschool. She's the owner of Nike Anderson's Classroom, a virtual shop for educational resources, and she's been featured in local news outlets advocating homeschool. She resides in Middle Georgia with her husband and two young sons. Welcome, Nike. It's so nice to meet you officially. I get a really strong, happy, very peaceful vibe on your Instagram channel. Yes. And it's an encouragement. You know, you <laughs> I think you can pick certain Instagram um, accounts just so that you can be surrounded by a community that maybe you don't know them personally. We're obviously on the opposite side of the continent right now, but they just create a really nice space to be in. Yes, yes. Spread the love and positivity. <laughs> You're in the beautiful state where peaches grow heartily, but I don't know which um, season you're in. Are you in the peach season right now? Uh, is it peach season? It's, yeah, I think everything is about strawberries right now. I keep seeing um, a lot of the local orchards, their Facebook pages, they're posting strawberry pictures. So We're in snow season right now. Oh. And the- I probably only have about 10 fruit trees in my very tiny orchard, but the one tree that isn't working is the peach tree. So this year I've got a mission, go get a peach tree. But I was actually in your state a few years ago for a (laughs) wedding and it was an absolutely stunning wedding. Like I've never seen before on somebody's old peach orchard, I think. That does sound beautiful. (laughs) So tell me a little bit about you. So you're in Vancouver. We're actually, I'm about 10 or 11 hours from Vancouver um so I know people associate oh okay okay. I haven't been there for about a year and a half now because of all of the precautions and all the things that we're required not to do but um yeah we we live in that that province and we still have a wee bit of snow until we get going in the garden so tell me um for those that don't know you already you have two boys and you live in Georgia. Tell me a little bit about when you started homeschooling, what got you started homeschooling and about your family. Um, woo, let's see, where should I start? Um, I never really heard about homeschooling, to be honest, growing up because we lived in, I'm originally from Rhode Island and Rhode Island is a high regulation state um, here in the United States. So not many people homeschool. And so I just didn't, it isn't a, um, like it is in the South where I am now. And so I just never really ran into anyone that homeschooled. So um, during my master's program, I was studying alternative modes of education. And that's actually when I became formally introduced to homeschooling. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. People are like teaching their own children <laughs> and able to like modify curriculum to fit their child's needs. And um, I was a first time parent at the time. So my first son was, he was still a baby. He won yet. And I thought to myself, you know what, that seems like something we would do, but it was just kind of romanticized, you know, um, young parents at the time, you know, we was like, gosh, what, 24 and new family. And so, you know, we were, trying to get our files in order. So it just seemed like a pipe dream because I was like, oh, we need two incomes if I was, if I'm going to stay home and things of that nature. Um, But then fast forward to uh, when my son, my oldest son um, became of school age around three or four years old. Um, He went to a preschool and the preschool was pretty much structured like the public schools here. And, um, He just turned into a completely different child. Um, Just, he's usually bubbly and happy. And um, my husband would have to drop him off um, at the preschool. And my husband said, you know, he's, he's just not 
the same child. He he just doesn't want to go. He's he's walking, you know, really slowly, and you know, he just seems really depressed, honestly. And I said, well, you know, no child likes school, <laughs> you know what I mean. But I'm concerned about uh, bullying. Um, especially the the teachers. So the teachers were the bullies in this case. And um, I said, you know what? Um, let's revisit that idea about homeschooling and let's just try it just for one year. Let's just see how it's going to work for us. And that's what I did. I committed to one year of trying the homeschooling thing. I did want to quit uh, mid-year, <laughs> but um, I said, no, you said one year. <laughs> You said one year, so let's do that one year. And after pushing through that sort of um, what everyone calls like the, you know, January, that kind of that stage there, after pushing through that, um, I was like, okay, I think I can do this. You know, I know how to read. And he's himself again. He's his bubbly, talkative self. He's thriving. And I think this is something that we can do. So that's how we ended up uh, getting started. In I the had a similar, world. Yeah, I had a similar experience with my eight-year-old as well. I didn't think about homeschooling as quickly as you did. I wish I'd thought about it then. Didn't even know it existed then. Um, but when she was about eight, she was in grade, end of grade two, I saw the same thing where she was just bored and listless. And she said she was being bullied, although someone in the classroom that was a, an a adult helper said, I don't know, she kind of looks like she's competing for Queen Bee. She's a really strong kid. Um, but whatever mm-hmm. the case, it wasn't an environment that made her look like she came alive, look like she just kind of went mm. through the motions and she was pretty bored. Yeah, but you know, that first year, you tried to make it through your first year, that says a lot about you, forcing your way through it and saying, I committed, I'm going to do this thing. What was what was your thought around, I'm going to do this thing? I've made a commitment to this. Did you have a certain value attached to that? Yeah, yes, definitely. I felt really convicted. Um, you know, I come from a religious background. So my faith had a lot to do with um, that conviction. I just felt strongly in my spirit that this is something that our family should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I know that with anything you feel a conviction about, there will be adversity and you will feel like you want to quit. And so knowing that, um, I was able to armor myself and just push forward and, and push through that, um, trouble, you know, that troubling time. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That is like what you just said is so representative of this last year. I feel, um, you know, you probably are feeling it. There's so many challenges. We we've all experienced so many different things. Maybe you are more uniquely even, but this has been such a year. And to remember that it's not going to always be like this. We can actually keep going because there is hope, there is faith, we're looking forward to the future, what's going to happen next. That's really beautiful. But in that first year, you experience what I call slump month. I know there's many names for that. But (laughs) it's really classic at the slump month period to say, I'm out, I am so done with this. Mm -hmm. And I, by the way, I also did that in my third year. And finally said, okay, where is that yellow bus? Because they are going on that bus. I'm so done with this. But what did you learn about yourself and your children in that first challenging year? Uh, I learned that I wasn't as patient as I thought. (laughs) First (laughs) off. Um, But I learned that this journey was a lot about me, just as much as it was about my children. I've learned um, just so many things about myself and my virtues and Um, Just what I needed to continue to grow and develop on as far as those virtues go. And my children, I've just learned that um, they are, they are capable of, you know, learning and leading their own education journey. And um, that's just something that I had to wrap my mind around, you know, coming, me being a product of the public school system myself. uh, And, um, I was very good at it. (laughs) You know, I was an A student. I was valedictorian. And so it was difficult for me to wrap my mind around uh, children leading their own education um, because that's just far from what I was used to. 
and just seeing them just learning and me just facilitating what they're doing versus, you know, me forcing them to sit down and but and say, okay, let's we're gonna learn this, that, and the third, you know, I'm just taking their lead, you know, really. Amen. And so Amen. that Amen. that was very essential for me, I think, to learn. I'm glad I learned that in the first year. Yeah, amazing. I did not learn that in the first year. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> that took me years to figure out because even mm-hmm. uh, my husband was the A student valedictorian. I was the Cole's note mm-hmm. version of high school. And we both come from that public schooled mindset, though, that an education happens like this and we all know what this is and it doesn't happen by facilitating a child's natural interests or their natural aptitudes or their learning styles or whatever it sounds really loosey-goosey for most people to to listen to that what what does that mean practically then how do you actually have an education but in in on the ground I should say as a homeschool mom with real children your children when you're observing your children you identify this is who they really are. This is what they really want to learn. This is how they want to learn. This is an education. So I noticed that you said um, on your Instagram page or your website, you are a whole child educator. Would you tell me what that means for you? Um, Basically educating the entire child, like just coming from the mindset that children are not just their cognitive abilities, that they have a spiritual side, you know, they have an emotional side, um, educating them socially and physically and making sure they reach those physical minds, milestones as well, you know, the fine and the gross motor skills and um, things of that nature. So um, the idea that there are six selves of a person and that you should um, really cater and honor to all parts of a child to make sure they get a well-rounded education. Now, where did you you get that from? Where did you, did you read this or did you take an education in this, or this is your education of watching your children? This is something I learned um, from my master's program. I have a master's of education um, and educational leadership. So um, that's something I've learned and it's just always stuck with me. And I know that Charlotte Mason and some other homeschool um, methods also kind of cater to that mindset of like educating the whole child. Um, so yeah, that was just something that has always stuck with me since I uh, have learned about it. That is really beautiful. And also when, when you talk about the six selves or the six different aspects of a person, I think instinctively I go, oh yeah, right. I'm I think I naturally do address that. I actually slow down enough to try to pay attention to that now. I didn't always, (laughs) Um, but those six selves, um, would you tell me what they are and how you actually engage them practically with your kids? Yes. So there is, of course, the cognitive, um, which, you know, we, we do a lot of like brain teaser activities and just a lot of um, fun, engaging activities that require them to, um, think and sharpen their brains, you know, sharpen their memory skills and things like that. And of course, you know, normal school work would do that too. <laughs> but um, there's the cognitive side, there's the physical. Um, so I'm really big on making sure that kids play and take lots and lots of play break- breaks and going outside, getting that fresh air. Um, we jump on a trampoline a lot. <laughs> that That's is something awesome. they... They never get tired of doing that. They never get tired of riding their bikes and scooters, going to the park, doing climbing. And, you know, we go on hikes and we just do a lot of that active things. But then also, um, you know, the educative side to that. So they understand why we do that. They understand that it's important for humans to move and that it's important for their bodies to, um, you know, challenge itself, you know, and uh, so, and learn new skills and get stronger in certain things. Like, you know, my son, he really wants to increase his upper body strength. So he knows in order to do that, I have to practice climbing more, like at the park and have the little climbing walls and, and things like that. And, and um, so just, you know, also learning the educational aspect of physical activity and why we're doing it. And so they know, so there's less pushback 
when you say go outside and play because they understand, okay, we're not just going outside and playing. We are actually, you know, helping ourselves to develop, you know, and, and to prosper. And in turn, that helps their brain as well mm -hmm. to grow and develop and, and prosper. And so there's the physical. There is also the, um, some people group these together, but there's the social and the emotional. So we are very big on um, making sure our kids, you know, engage not just with other kids, but just people of all age ranges. You know, um, we are part of several different homeschool groups uh, locally. And between those homeschool groups, they keep us busy with co-ops and field trips and play dates and, and all that stuff. And, you know, again, the educational side of that and helping my children to do things like, you know, like when you meet someone new, um, how would we introduce ourselves and, and make sure you ask for their name. And if you want to play with them again, you know, make sure, you know, you ask like, hey, you know, is it OK for your mom to talk to my mom? And they can exchange information and, you know, that sort of thing um, and um, helping them to navigate social pressures and um, things like that. Just keeping the line of communication open. So they want to tell me about their, their social problems and, mm -hmm. and me and my husband can help them to navigate that as well. And um, so it's, that's a lot about being intentional and just having those, conversa those types of conversations um, with your children. And then there's also the um, emotional part of, of, you know, learning and, um, and I always say this, like, I wish when I was a kid, you know, I suffered from anxiety. I wish somebody would have just said, just, just breathe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, you know, I didn't know what I was going through. I didn't know, like, how to navigate that, like, how to make myself feel better. Um, so helping them, you know, and being more intentional and in noticing their cues and helping them to notice what their cues are and say, hey, do you notice that when you spend more than uh, an hour watching television that you seem to get a bit agitated and, and you see, are you noticing this and just making them aware of um, what their boundaries are for like television screen time um, what their boundaries are you know with relationships and and things like that and and just um, just helping them to become more self-aware and also giving them coping mechanisms like when you're angry like you know we don't throw stuff we don't hit, we don't, you know, um, yell and scream, you know, we just, we go to our room and, you know, um, we just think, we pray, we um, breathe, we take deep breaths. And if you need a hug, I'm always here. You can give me a hug, you know, and um, they do that. My youngest son is a serial hugger. So <laughs> anytime he's feeling like not great he will just come and say mom I, I just I just need a hug and that helps him you know to manage his emotions and and feel better and and go about his day feeling a lot better so we do have a lot of those conversations and um you know the fifth fifth self would be the spiritual um side of that and so we do devotionals but we just don't do devotionals we worship we sing we dance together um, you know, do all of those things to help us feel spiritually connected and in and, and tune, um, you know, just letting them know, like, you know, your faith and your relationship is your journey. And, um, you know, that's, that's your thing, you know, and however you feel comfortable and confident to, um, maneuver that journey is that's okay. Like, you don't have to do it like I do it, you know, you can, do your own, you know, do your own thing. And um, so helping them to understand the, their spiritual self as it relates to faith. And my faith personally is is Christ, you know, I'm a Christian. And so um, as it relates to Christ in their life and letting them know that, hey, like you don't need an intercessor, you know, you can go to him directly and, you know, you can talk to him whenever you want. And that has really helped them um, just that that spiritual um, connection has really helped them to navigate life as well. And um, I'm very grateful for that. And so what are we on the, we did the fifth one. <laughs> so um, the sixth is creative. See, the original selves is five selves. I added the sixth self. I added the spiritual part. 
because originally it's the spiritual part is omitted and they just do creative. So um, the six would be creative. And um, I definitely encourage them to be very innovative and be creative, especially when it comes to technology. You know, all kids love it. All kids love to be on their computers and tablets. And I always say like, you know, let's be, um, let's not be consumers. Let's be innovators. Like let's, huh. let's contribute. Like, so they make their own video games, you know, they, they make their own animations and um, just getting them into the mindset of, you know, like, not having too much mindless screen time, like some of it is okay, but um, you want to get in the mindset of being creative and also off screen. So they love to draw and um, sometimes they feel like they need a tutorial to like, I want to draw something specific and I need a YouTube tutorial. And sometimes I do have to force them to use their imagination and say, you know what, why don't we just why don't you just draw it the best way you can from your imagination? And, you know, because I've noticed that there's a dependence sometimes on tutorials and YouTube and things like that. And that can kind of stagnate creativity in kids as well. So I think parents should be just a little careful, you know, of of that, um, you know, that aspect of like YouTube and like other platforms that, you know, do tutorials and everything. So um, we definitely are a creative family, of course, like I'm a writer by nature. My husband is, you know, everything else. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he loves music and he's a singer. And, um, and so we just are a very creative family. And so my kids, it's, it's fun to see how, their where their creativity will take them and lead them you know in the future it's just really fun figuring them out and still learning them and and um especially as they reach different milestones and different ages you know um it's just really a great process and journey to see them develop in all of those six selves and seeing how far they've come and see how far I've come because I'm helping me as well. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, I was, um, I was all just, this stuff that I didn't learn as a child. Yeah. That, that I is didn't learn it as a child. Thinking. You've given me so many things that I'm like, oh, I want to go into so many different directions. Hmm. But I, you know, since this is the focus of homeschool mom self care, when you have these values or when we as homeschool moms have these frameworks for how we want to homeschool our kids. I've learned that those frameworks come from our own self development. They've come from our own self, you know, our journeys. So what has been your, your story behind those different elements? It came from the fact that, you know, like I said before, I was a very um, anxious child growing up. So I was very, um, I was in the gifted programs and um, you know, that, kind of ostracized me from the rest of my peer circle. So, (laughs) you know, that wasn't fun. So, you know, being, you know, Nigerian as well and having a funny name and, um, you know, coming from that, you know, um, coming from the public school and knowing like the goods, I had, you know, good teachers. I had terrible teachers, you know, (laughs) as we all do. I've had good experience, bad experiences. And so, um, you know, as I'm always, I'm a reflector. So I'm always thinking like to myself, like what, what is it like that I wish that someone would have told me or taught me like as a child, you know, um, what are those, you know, what are those things, you know, and um, definitely um, the social emotional, you know, because I didn't really know how to, you know, interact with other people. I was very socially awkward. I was very nervous. I was very like anxious, but very smart. (laughs) And so, you know, I was very like exceptional in this area of my life, but then what about the others? What about the social? What about the emotional? What about, you know, the spiritual? I didn't grow up in a religious household, but I became, you know, born again as a teenager. When Actually, when I met my husband, he was the one that inspired me to, you know, enter and, and give my life to Christ and things like that. So we are high school sweethearts. But oh. um <laughs> but yeah, just um just reflecting and asking myself like what are those things that I wish um I would have known? What are the tools that I want to give to my children to help them? And of course things won't be perfect. 
they'll grow up to be adults and they'll probably have some voids that they, you know, in life because nobody's perfect. But if I can help them avoid some of the, you know, some of the negatives, you know, that I myself have come across when it comes to um, like school and society and education, that's, I feel like that's my job and that's my my calling to to pass the baton and, and help them to go further than I was able to go. And for me, that further is developing all of their selves and and being very intentional about making sure that they're wholly developed and I'm not just focused on one particular area of their life, you know, because, you know, you meet kids and, you know, they're, they're great. They've been reading since two years old, but they have no manners or they, you know, or they are just immature, you know, socially or emotionally or, you know, things of that nature. And, you know, that's okay. Everyone has their own journey, you know, no kid develops the same way at the same time. We all know that, but, um, you know, like I said, it's just more about being intentional about ensuring that they know that there's more to them than their minds, that there's more areas of them that they focus on even as they grow into adulthood and to go ahead and nurture all of those parts of themselves. You know, you're talking about classical education or public school education that we are both familiar with, Mm where most people are familiar with. Um, And but you're also now saying that you are wanting to enable your children to have this fullness, their their full selves developed, or at least given the opportunity to explore all those different selves. The thing that I think a lot of non-homeschool parents or newer homeschool parents don't realize is that we can actually help uncover who they really are and what they're meant to do. And that what is an education anyways, we actually get to help develop what an education is for our specific kids. We actually get to take ownership of what we want to teach them or what we want, maybe not even to teach, but to facilitate fully all these different selves. And that is such a privilege. It's also such a responsibility. And we we (laughs) feel that responsibility and everybody asks us about that responsibility. So we feel even more responsible. And yet it's a really, it's a beautiful freedom to have as homeschool families to say, okay, I'm seeing my children. I'm observing my children and I'm trying to help them in all these different areas so they can become who they were meant to be and do what they were meant to do so that they have purpose and value and meaning on this earth in the unique ways that they were meant to. I think that's a beautiful privilege and a responsibility all at the same time. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, you know, without the um, pressure of conformity, you know, um, because I did go through that myself, even, you know, growing up in the public school system, like, I didn't want to be the smart kid anymore. I didn't want to, you know, I just wanted to fit in. And I wanted my life to be easier. And so, you know, I did rebel at a certain time. And I feel like if I had the opportunity to just continue to be myself and and walk in my purpose and calling and who I am, um, I I would be more confident in that, like as a, as a child, as a teenager, I would have been more confident in that. But because I was in a setting where they're sort of pushed to conform, you know, not just by students, but like I said, some teachers can be, um, you know, can push you to conform as well and, and want you to be like everyone else to make their job easier. Um, you know, if you're the smart kid and you're always finishing your work on time, well, you know, and you, I mean, early, you're finishing your work early and, and it's a, it becomes a problem for them because now they have to come up with extra work for you to do. And so they're like, oh, you know, can you just be like the other kids and finish when the other kids finish and not do it so fast? And, you know, and it becomes a problem. And I even see that, like, I have nieces and nephews who are in the public school system and and some of them are, are just really, really smart and they do finish their work super early and they've been labeled as problem children because they'll finish their work and then they'll be bored. And then so they want to talk to their friend over here. And so, you know, the teacher, you know, has a parent teacher conference and and they become labeled as, you know, problem children. And really it's just that, um, you know, the curriculum in the school is designed for 
you know, students to just be um, work at an average level. And so if you're working above average, you know, you're marginalized. And if you're working below average, you're also marginalized. And so the the children that need help and direction don't actually get it. And the children that need more of a, you know, um, they they need more of a push, you know, they need more of a challenge. They don't get that either. And only the kids that fall in the middle bracket are being served and, and so that's one of the disadvantages, you know, to the public school system that I've personally encountered and that I've, I continue to see that being walked out in the lives of, you know, my nieces and nephews who are also in, in that system as well. So you were saying earlier that you, because of this scenario and perhaps others, but you had an experience or had a challenge with anxiety. And Mm -hmm. I've learned this as a child, usually whatever I'm dealing with then, I'm still dealing with somehow now, but Mm -hmm. I certainly am, um, I think I was only 30 when I started realizing that, or like really it was 30 years old when I started to realize what some of my challenges were. And I felt a freedom to start pursuing who am I really, what am I really all about? What are the things that are keeping me from fully showing up in my life? And at that point, I started to, I would say, get to know myself and Mm -hmm. learn coping mechanisms for how to engage the things that are really challenging inside of me. And that is where the story of my book really originated is learning how to find ways to deal with the really difficult feelings, the grappling with all those uncomfortable feelings. We have them as humans, but in the unique scenario as homeschool mom, we get them in the homeschool mom package. And, you know, that we've talked on this podcast about many different feelings. There's many different experiences people have had, like doubt or perfectionism or feeling not good enough or anger or ah, so many. Right. We're humans. But you're speaking to anxiety. How do you help facilitate that with your kids and what school or skills or strategies have you learned to manage anxiety? Let's see. Um, Well, a lot of the anxiety um, had become social anxiety. And that stemmed from, you know, being told that you were too much. And so trying to scale, you know, trying to minimize yourself so that other people would feel comfortable and not wanting to seem, you know, you're just trying to control what other people are thinking of you. Essentially, like you don't want to seem braggadocious you don't want to seem you know like just too much and so um you know I developed that as a child you know through just personal experiences that I've been through like in school and with family and so that carried itself into my adulthood and so I wouldn't actually know how to be you Uh know (laughs) I wouldn't actually know how to be and you know I did go through um a phase in college where um you know, like I, I succumbed to like a lot of drinking and things like that, because that was the only way I felt like I could be myself. And then I realized, you know, um, that that's a potential problem when you're relying on something to, you know, be yourself. And I I realized, hey, you know, I'm doing this because I'm trying so hard to fit in. And I don't think that myself is good enough. That realization came at I think I was 21 years old since then I I had been on a journey to um, just reflect and and try to work through this you know this social anxiety you know I had become more deeper into my faith and you know I, I stand on a lot of the verses you know from the bible that talk about anxiety and and just casting your anxiety onto God and, and I realized that it's something that I have to do. Like I can't, it's not just God take this away from me. There's an action that's required on my part. I have to give it to him. I have to, there's, there's a, there's a proactiveness. And once I became proactive, it really just started to help me, you know, to relax, (laughs) so to speak, and just be like, you know what? It's, it's okay. The awkward silence is okay. If you stumble on your words, it's okay. Uh, If, Someone, you can't control what people think of you. So if you speak of an accomplishment and they think you're being braggadocious, well, that's not your fault. That's 
that's them. That's on them. Like, just be who you are. You can't control what other people think of you. The people that love you and want to think the best of you will think the best of you. And the people who don't, they're always going to find something yeah. wrong or yeah. they're always going to pinpoint something about you that they don't like. And you have zero control over that. So just once I gave up that need to have control, um, it became a lot easier. And, you know, even still suffering from anxiety about, you know, little things, you know, like um, work and homeschool and things like that. I still take that verse to heart and, and give it, you know, and just say, you know, and I even picture myself at the altar and I picture the word anxiety in my hand and I picture just placing it on the altar and giving it to God. And, you know, just the visual illustration that I have in my head. Like you can just literally feel the weight leaving you. Those are a lot of the practices that I personally do. And with my kids, I watch for signs in them. And it goes back to where I was saying that I ask them questions like, hey, do you notice that when you do this, like you, you start to, you know, you know, you start to get a little anxious or whatever. I let them know what these feelings are called because as a child, I didn't know what anxiety was. I didn't know what my feelings were called. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't know what it was. And I, and, and, you know, if you don't know what you're going through, if you don't know what your ailment is, you know, you can't really work towards the healing process. And so letting them know what it is, is the first, you know, power that I'm giving them and saying, Hey, this, you're feeling anxious. And I remember when I took my seven-year-old, he was six at the time, to his dentist appointment. He had to get a, a cap on one of his teeth. And he was sitting in the chair and he told the dentist, he said, I'm feeling really, really anxious. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, you're feeling anxious. I have something to help you. And she was able to give him, you know, some of the, the laughing gas to kind of calm his anxiety but it was just a really proud moment because, you know, he was able to pinpoint how he was feeling. I gave him the word for his feelings and, and he took it with him. And he, and he knows like, whenever I'm feeling like this, this is called anxiousness. And so, you know, he, by being able to express that to the dentist, she was like, oh, hey, like I've got something for you to, have to relax. And he was able to relax and he went through it and he was fine and, and, I was like, I said, wow, that was so great how you were able to express to the dentist exactly how you were feeling. You were able to pinpoint it and express, you know, and I said, you know, that is, that is why we do what we do. That is why I let you guys know, you know, um, all of the feelings that you're feeling and we go through feelings and emotions and things like that. And, and so it was, it was a really great moment. That is one of the biggest things that we can teach our children. I often, you know, get asked about socialization, Um, not so much this year anymore, but but everybody's worried about socialization this year. Before this, it was always the S question. I'm not worried about that. Academics are usually the thing that homeschool families will ask about. Now I've been in this long enough to realize I'm also not worried about that. But it's the social or the uh, emotional awareness and teaching an a lexicon of what an um, you know all the emoticon emotions out there to really help us identify what's going on inside here to be able to sit with what's going on inside here to be comfortable with it and to be self compassionate with what is happening inside here and to have mechanisms to actually address the challenges because I think for me growing up we definitely didn't discuss feelings, but I know for sure that even if we did have the feelings, we weren't supposed to feel them. And I I know for sure, even in the beginning of my parenting, no question, I'm processing this now, um, realizing that, you know, especially with my oldest having chats with us about, I wasn't allowed to feel certain things. And I'm like, oh, wow. I wasn't trying to get my kids not to feel their feelings, you know, in the earlier stages of parenting. I was just so anxious by their feelings. And it made me feel like, oh, please don't feel that way. Or please manage it so that I don't have to deal with your feelings, because I'm already worried about my feelings. And, and that is messy. But that's a reality of all parenting is that we just don't do it all right. 
but you know, we're growing right alongside them and we're learning right alongside them. But I think the biggest thing about um, uh, the opportunity we have as homeschool families is so that we can facilitate that entire emotional lexicon. And how do you deal with this stuff, which I'm still dealing with too. It, you know, we still are growing. It's not like it stops. It's true. Yeah, that is so very true, you know, about the mistakes you make as a parent, you know, like, I'm not perfect. Um, my parents weren't perfect. And so, you know, I give them grace, because I know that I'm not perfect. There'll probably be things that my children would say when they're adults that I didn't do perfectly or you know so um it's all it's just a, a learning curve and yes, you know is. that's what that's what I tell a lot of people when they say like I can't homeschool because I I I, I just don't have patience I just <laughs> don't have this I don't have that and yeah. I say you know you don't have to have any of that actually what you have to have is a commitment to grow in those areas. Amen. And so if you commit yourself to growing in patience, if you commit yourself to growing in the different virtues, um, you will have everything you need to be able to homeschool. And, you know, that's something that I've learned, you know, on a spiritual level, like I thought that I had to be put together and, you know, even with a master's in education, like I've, it, that could not have prepared me for homeschool and everyone says like oh you have a master's in education like that's why you homeschool and 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 that's why you're so good at it and I'm like actually no no (laughs) no it's because I'm patient (laughs) it's like actually no like you know the master's degrees in education does not prepare you for homeschool it don't it don't make you any more of a, you know, novice or expert than any other parent, because we're all starting from square one. This is a learning process for all of us. And um, we're all committed to growing and learning, you know, um, as a family, like personally, you know, in in and of our own selves. And so, you know, it, it, it's not about like, your credentials or (laughs) there's there's no such thing as credentials when it comes to homeschooling except maybe that you know you've been in it for 10 to 20 years (laughs) you know maybe (laughs) then (laughs) but um but yeah we're it's just it's just a a grown process but you know I, I love I love the growth and I love that that process of of growing um you know just feeling like I'm becoming better you know just you know, a better mother, better wife, a better person, friend, you know, in general, you know, I'm learning just as much as my children are learning, Absolutely. You know, to be quite honest. If not more, I think, because I, I identify when I'm listening to you talk, I actually say, my husband is your experience growing up and the, mm-hmm. you know, the kid that was too smart for the teacher really, mm-hmm. and, and didn't, didn't fit in and was very self-aware, self-conscious of how he didn't fit in. And I wasn't that student truth. I wasn't that student. Um, I did the Coles notes version as much as I could. I tried to watch the movie instead of read the book. (laughs) I've made up for it from lost time. I've read a lot of books in the last 30 years. (laughs) But there was a time where I had an experience, which I feel like very much was a God experience when I was in the passport office reading a book called The Normal Christian Life, which doesn't represent this book at all, by Watchman Nee. He's a missionary to India. And he was talking about grace. And I think this is so appropriate to this weekend because this is Easter weekend but the the discussion whatever I was reading from the book of Romans which is all about grace and forgiveness really spoke to me that I didn't have a really strong sense of how God saw me I thought I was supposed to do all these things so I would measure up so that God could approve of me and I would never have said that out loud I knew that wasn't the right thing to say but for the previous 20 years that is how I functionally engaged you know, God, I think. And at that moment, and reading that book, I had this, like, ah, moment, where I realized, uh, no, you're accepted by grace, like fully accepted by grace. And that was hugely shifting for me and how I became more self accepting. Um, Not just all the good things about me, but also recognizing I am not going to measure up. It's not about that. But there is like, there's a real crossover, I think, between the messaging that I got 
in that book and at that time in my church, but also in the culture about growth. And I think there's a parallel there because we're called to growth. And I think this whole thing, this whole world and this whole life and this definitely this past year is about growth. And you will sign up for growth if you are a homeschool parent. (laughs) Yes, you will. will. Yes, you will. And it's funny that you mentioned grace because, you know, I just celebrated a birthday this past weekend. Happy birthday. Thank you. And um, my family asked me, like, you know, what have you learned? And they think I'm old because my siblings are a lot younger than I am. (laughs) So they're like, so in your 36 years of living, (laughs) what have you learned? And, you know, (laughs) and grace, grace was the first thing that came to mind. I said, you know, I've learned that everyone needs grace. And, um, you know, just realizing that, first of all, I need to, to give myself grace, you know, and when you do that, like when you allow yourself to have grace and to see yourself the way God sees you, then you're able to give that to your children Mm -hmm. and your family. And, um, you know, you just become less critical and judgmental of others, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that's something I've learned along the way, like, you know, if I'm critical or judgmental of other people, it's because I'm critical and judgmental of my own self. Yep. And um, just making sure that my children understand, you know, um, that they also need to give themselves grace. And, you know, like you're not going to um, be excellent in every subject, like some some subjects you're going to, yeah, you have str- strengths and weaknesses, you know, and they want to be great at everything. <laughs> And that's just not possible. Like, let's focus on, you know, what you, your strengths and let's become even greater, you know, and your weaknesses. I, yeah, you know, I mean, you, we can grow in the weaknesses, but I feel like you grow more in your weaknesses when you focus on your strengths, if that makes yeah. sense. And so just giving them, you know, allowing yourself to have grace as a parent so that you can have it left over to give to your children, especially homeschooling. Sometimes, uh, you know, um, it can be difficult. And, you know, I have a very strong willed learner and it takes, a, it requires a lot of prayer <laughs> and a lot of bathroom breaks where I say, God, if you don't intervene, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> the number one rule in the house is do not bother do not bother mommy when she is in the bathroom because she's most likely <laughs> praying to go. <laughs> to Good luck with that one, girlfriend. And <laughs> I had an 18 year old last summer. Yeah, that was yeah. It, it's, no, the, it's the rule, but you know, yeah, rule, yeah. made to be broken in that case. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, just, just, you know, allowing for grace to, to happen, but realizing that when we give grace to ourselves, that we're able to then give it to others and that it just starts with us and realizing that, you know, when I'm pointing out other people's flaws, it's because that's how I am towards me. And when I fix me, when I fix that, then I can, you know, be less judgmental and picking out things and, you know, picking out flaws and in, in other people. So lately, yeah. I've been, lately, I'm finding this fascination with Enneagram. Are you familiar with Enneagram? Ah uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I did do the the test, and the mostly I'm a seven. Seven, okay. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, I'm a two. So okay. you're, you're very cash. You're pretty relaxed. You're the one that everyone everyone wants to hang out with, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I can see it on Instagram too. You're totally fun. But I find um, the learning more about yourself and kind of getting a sense of what your kids are like although I know they say not to profile kids but getting a sense of how you have base needs and you're working from your base needs and you're not always getting them satisfied and it manifests Mm -hmm. in different ways that interplay in all the different relationship dynamics that's really helpful to study that I find yes because it actually makes you more gracious towards them then I look at my Enneagram type eight kiddo who sounds like your strong-willed kiddo that I that is no longer in my home now and I go oh okay so this is where she was thinking when she was engaging meanwhile as Uh I'm taking this very very differently and um, it's really just useful to 
facilitate grace. Not that it, I, and it also helps you understand that you're not changing anybody. <laughs> they are what they yes. are. Yes, 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 yes. I think studying your children's personalities, like even like, um, you know, what's allowed me to be more gracious to them even is studying their, their learning styles yes. and realizing like, okay, this child is a, a like a sound musical learner. So we can't just sit here and do rote memorization. Like it has to be in a fun, rhythmic way um, that they can understand and remember that they'll want to be a part of it. And um, that has allowed me to give them more grace, even just knowing like how they learn and, and um, you know, in conjunction with their personalities as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Just understanding like, okay, um, you know, like you said, not completely boxing them in to that because, like with everything you know there are um you're gonna spill out of the box in certain areas you know like um you can be a 70 percent you know enneagram seven but then a 75 percent enneagram eight you know what i mean so or uh you know a large percentage of another enneagram and so you have to look at both of them you know but um i feel like that's the same thing with kids like you know they could their dominant learning style could be one way and, but they can also have another dominant learning style. And so just not just, you know, being careful not to box them in, but then also like it is helpful to use as a tool, as a parent to um, cater to that learning style. So there'll be less frustration in your homeschool and um, you can understand why, why they're not sitting still, why they're not, you know, receptive to, you know, your teaching method or your style that you've adopted and, and, you know, just really being able to change your teaching method to fit each child. And, you know, each child is different. I just have two children and both of them are vastly different when it comes to learning, you know? Um, So I have to have two different approaches, you know, when it comes to that, like the child is like independent, just, okay, just give me my work. And, you know, like, you don't have to sit over my shoulder and, you know, I'm just going to get this done. And the other child is very, very needy in a sense of like, I need you here with me every step of the way. And, you know, that's okay, you know, and, and, you know, every child is different, you know, and that's another thing that parents, you know, going into it the first year, they might not get a sense of every child being different because that's not what we're used to as a society. We're yeah. used to children being in the same grade, accomplishing the same things, reaching the same milestones at the same time, and everything is the same, same, same. And then you get into this homeschool world, and you realize, like, okay, like, you know, I, even people who have twins, I've noticed that people who have twins, they'll say that one twin will can, learns this way. One twin could be an auditory learner. The other twin can be a kinesthetic learner and have two different personalities when it comes to learning. And, you know, they have to cater to both of those personalities. And But in the school system, they'll be in the same classroom, learning the same thing the same way at the same time. That's the the beauty of homeschooling is is that you can really uh, individualize a child, you know, and, yes. and cater to their learning style and personalities. So what I didn't sign up for as a homeschool parent is learning about me and all the stuff that I had to learn about right. me. So it turns out these little ones that we created are or help to be part of the creative creation. It, they are little mini mirrors, I think. And we learn all sorts of things about us. What have you learned about yourself through your homeschooling? Let's see, what have I learned about myself from these little mirrors of mine? <laughs> yeah. I've learned that that I can be a perfectionist. I never considered myself as a perfectionist, but when I watch, you know, my oldest son in particular, and when I see how like he's very fixated on grades and percentages, and we try not to do that in homeschool, but they have they do have a math program that's online, and so it automatically gives you percentages and things like that. And some of that, part of that, is very motivating to them. Like he's very motivated because he's very competitive, and he's like. Like, if I get lower than this percentage, I'm going to keep going until I get the percentage. I've got that kid. Yeah. (laughs) And I've realized that, you know, I've realized that about myself. 
And so I realized, oh, wow, I can't help him until I help myself. Like, <laughs> I can't give him any tools until I learn how to, how to deal with that part of myself. Right. And, um, you know, and, and I'm still dealing with that part of myself. And so as I deal with that part of myself, I'm able to, you know, give him a few breadcrumbs along the way and say, okay, like, you know, um, it's great that you are very ambitious. It's great that you want to be the best at everything, you know, but as far as like, you know, like sometimes, you know, you just have to accept less than perfection and, and focus on the progress that you need. So some things I do with him is, you know, if he, if he has a spelling test, for instance, and he gets a 70% and he's like, oh, 70%, oh, that would bum him out, <laughs> you know, like 70%. I say, you know, but these are the new words you learned that you didn't know last week. You've learned X amount of new words. You know, let's say you learned seven new words out of 10 or 12 new words out of 20. I don't know. But you, in helping him to redirect his focus and say, okay, but you, you've learned these new words and forget about those other three words that if you want to work on that, you can, but look how many new words you learned that you didn't know how to spell reframing a yeah. of weeks ago and, you know, doing the same thing for myself and, you know, saying, okay, you, you didn't get this done or you didn't get that done, you know, on your to-do list, but wow, look at, look, you got this, look at all you've gotten done, you know, and, and focusing on the positives and, and what, what I have accomplished is like what I didn't accomplish. Cause I'm very like, I think a lot of us just tend to go to, what we didn't do, what we didn't accomplish, right. the negatives, and just it takes a retraining of your mind. The Bible says renewing your mind to begin to start focusing on the positive, you know, and there's even a verse about that, like think of things that are lovely and pure and excellent and praiseworthy. And I take that, you know, with me to heart at night. I'm like, okay, so what is praise? What did I do that is very, that's praiseworthy, that's excellent? You know, what did I do today? Because that's, that's how God deals with us. He loves us. And that's how he deals with us. He deals with the positive and, and, you know, he's not like a, he's not an accuser, <laughs> you know, like the enemy is an accuser. And so God is not an accuser. He's not like you've done all this wrong and therefore you're a terrible person or a terrible mom. Look at, look at all that you've accomplished today. And, and it brings you a sense of comfort and it brings you a sense of accomplishment, which then, you know, inspires you to do better and become better. And there's no inspiration in accusation. Like if people accuse you, there's no inspiration in that. And even I bring that into parenthood and remind myself, accuse my kids, you know, there's no inspiration in that, you know, you're not inspiring them to become better individuals. Like it's actually the opposite. And so bringing that into for us. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which I think in some ways is almost dare I say trickier because we have such a messaging as moms, you should be everything. You should be God oh, to your children. Yes. And it's tricky because we're actually, I think it's almost like a gravitational pull. We're hardwired to say, what do you need? We are the source of what you need, but we're not the source, even though it kind of like, I think we are responsible to them, but we're also like, we're aware that we aren't perfect. We don't have it all. We don't have everything available. In fact, we're human beings that also need stuff. And we're not always necessarily even addressing our own needs. How do you address your needs or, or how do you create white space in your homeschool so that you actually can address your needs? First of all, just creating boundaries. I noticed that if I don't create boundaries with my children and even my spouse, that they tend to be overstepped. And so putting boundaries in place, like I said, one boundary is like, hey, if I'm in the bathroom and it's not an emergency, please don't knock on the door and <laughs> disturb me. And, you know, of course, younger children can't really do that. But now that my children are a bit older and they're, they're more understanding and more independent, you know, you can, you know, I can implement that kind yeah. of rule and say, you know, like, if I'm in the bathroom, just, just please let me just have my bathroom time, <laughs> you know, um, and they, and they pretty much, it's a pretty wide known rule, you know, in, in, around the house. Yeah. Um, but yeah, creating boundaries and, um, you know, even with like other things, like, you know, sometimes your kids want you to do everything for them and helping them to understand that, hey, you can do this yourself. Like, this is something that you're capable of doing and um you know even implementing that in homeschool like a lot of things that we've implemented like cooking 
and um, getting dressed. And um, I know I mentioned like on my Instagram about like, you know, showing your children how to like match their clothing and, you know, like um, what colors look best on you and, and, and things like that. And so we do that so that they know when they get dressed in the morning, they know um, what pairs well together and, you know, um, they know how to cook themselves basic meals. So, you know, breakfast time, hey, my 11 year old, he knows how to make eggs for him and his brother and toast and they know how to grab some fruit from the fruit bowl and have a, a great breakfast. And I don't have to be a part of that, <laughs> you know, because he's, he's, they're capable and he, likes that responsibility so in having that responsibility you know he's also growing and he's also growing in like self-confidence and awareness and which makes his younger brother want to do the same and and he's like I want to cook for myself and I want you know he wants to be more independent as well and so um creating boundaries and incorporating um the self-care into your homeschool curriculum and teaching your kids how to do things themselves so that you're not doing every single thing. And, um, you know, just carving out that time. There's no time that's too small or too little, like five minutes, you know, of time can be all you need to like refresh and renew. And I always tell moms just to start small, like, you know, because we're all in different um, parts, seasons of life. And so some new moms, they might not have a half hour to sit in a bubble bath and read a book and relax, you know, because they're new moms, they're nursing moms. And, you know, um, they've got other children that they have to tend to as well as their newborn baby. And so you might only just have five minutes to, you know, collect yourself, do it, do whatever you need to do, you know, pray, meditate, you know, if you're not religious, um, you know, do whatever you need to do to feel a sense of peace, you know, in your life and slowing down as well, slowing down and actually enjoying, um, having joy in homemaking, having joy in being a homeschool mom and having joy in, in being a wife, you know, just slow down, slowing down allows me to focus on the joyful aspect. So when I'm folding clothes and I just slow down and I'm not thinking, thinking of it as like, oh, folding clothes (laughs) right you know I've I've heard someone say before that when they fold clothes they pray for each child like as they touch the clothing they pray for the family member Mm whose clothes they're folding and you know I think that's amazing I think that's a great way to to um practice gratitude and and to have a just a a positive mindset about you know being a mom being a wife being you know a homeschooler And um, so, yeah, just slowing down and and remembering that this is a privilege, you know, so many people in other countries, you know, um, don't have the privilege to, you know, stay home with their children or teach their children or, you know, they don't even have the privilege in some countries to even do laundry, you know, they have to trek you know, long ways and miles to get water to bring, you know, to one place to to another, and, you know, and I'm Nigerian. And and so I've, I've been to those countries where, you know, that, that is a everyday life of of people. And so just thinking on a global scale of of how blessed we are um, in this Western world, like how blessed we are to have a lot of the luxuries we have to make our jobs easier as moms, you know, as wives and, and um, just realizing like, you know, hey, we're not everyone has these same luxuries, not everyone has the same privileges. And, you know, just slowing down enough to um, internalize that, you know, and I say lastly, also is, you know, just just get dressed, you know, <laughs> just, yeah, you know, and, and like I said, everyone is in different seasons of their life. And, you know, um, I have two younger siblings who are new parents and they've they've got infants and they've got toddlers and this is all new to them. And so, you know, it's difficult, um, but, you know, just creating a conscious effort to, um, um, what do I call it? Uh, Showing up. That's what Mm -hmm. I call it. Showing up for every day. So Mm -hmm. showing up for every day, it doesn't, you don't have to put on a ton of makeup and, you know, like you don't have to look like a movie star, every day just showing up you do right now by the way (laughs) oh 
thank you. Yeah, you really, the red is very, it works for you. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That goes into knowing what colors work for you and knowing your color palette and knowing what colors make you look, you know, um, the best and, you know, just little things like fun earrings, you know, can make you look like you've put more effort into yourself than you actually did. And, um, you know, a fun lip color can make you look like you put more effort than you really did. And there are lots of shortcuts to, you know, looking put together. And it doesn't have to take, you know, 30 minutes of your time in the morning. Like you can just, you know, every mom should have a five to 10 minute routine that, you know, they can just grab this from the closet and put this on and do a little concealer and you're, you're ready to greet your day, you know, like every mom should, should master that, you know, that should be it. That took me years. Yeah. Years. <laughs> yes. in yoga pants right now. <laughs> yes. And, you know, um, you know, whatever's best for doing what's best for you. So not everyone has the same values. Like I was brought up, you know, to just always look your best and, 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 you know, put your best foot forward and things of that nature. And not everyone has that background and not everyone cares, you know, and that's okay. And I think as we as moms, if we just like give grace to each other and stop judging, you know, like (laughs) stop judging the mom who wears sweatpants every day and stop judging the mom who has 10 pounds of makeup on, like, you know, we're all just, trying to do the best we can, you know, to navigate this world of motherhood. And we should just all have grace, you know, for each other. And, um, you know, it would make things a lot easier, you know, because I feel like a lot of the pressures we have um, as as moms, you know, that can kind of, um, you know, seep into like the, the mental health, you know, of mothers, you know, a lot of that comes from other moms judging, yeah. you know, other moms. So, you know, you don't feel like your house is clean enough or you don't feel like your house, your children are smart enough. You don't feel like you're put together enough. You don't feel, you know, all these things because we're all judging one another and, you know, we're all, or we're all pretending as well. You know, realness is really a, a virtue and being real and honest um, with each other about like our struggles and things like that is also a virtue you know, and and it's very helpful to other moms, because I know, like, when another, when another mom, you know, um, just reveals, like, you know, what they've been struggling with, like, that's helpful to me, you know, that's, like, okay, like, I'm not the only one, you know, dealing, dealing with that issue, so, you know, just being real, I feel like self, part of self-care is also being real, and being honest, it's the baseline, you know, yeah, I can feel really like nice. I can I can feel that from you on your Instagram page. And that's like what I said at the beginning of this conversation is that it feels like I'm with somebody that's authentic and peaceful and trying to be peaceful. And I know we all have our things that we're not, you know, fully laid bare but before everybody, but it feels authentic and it feels peaceful. We I see you on Instagram. Where else do I find you online? And what kind of resources do you provide for homeschool moms? You can also find me on Facebook at uh, the Nika Anderson. Um, I also have a um, online store called Nika Anderson's Classroom, and that's where I share my educational resources. So you can find a lot about the states, the U.S. states, and um, you can find a lot about Black history there, um, as well as some other um, nuggets. And um you can also find me, of course, at thehomeschoolgenius.com. That is where I blog and I share my love for all things homeschooling and just advocate for intentional homeschooling and whole child education um, there. So whoever's interested in that, you know, you can go ahead and follow me there. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think you that's know, everything. At the end of a conversation, I usually ask three, what I think are fun questions, because I just love hearing what are the responses to these. Um, I normally ask, where do you get your business name from? Um, Which I want to know, but I am dying to know where your mom got your name from. So you pronounce it Nikkei, right? Nikkei. And so for us that have all been exposed to the athletic brand, right. <laughs> it is spelled the same way. And yes. um, so where did your mom get the, the name idea from and what does it mean? 
Um, my, my dad actually was the one who um, came up with the name. So um, in the Nigerian culture, um, they actually wait to name the baby. They have what's called a name, a baby naming ceremony. So it's a big deal. And they kind of wait until like um, they can see like the, you know, kind of like the characteristics of the baby, like, you know, how the baby is and, you know, however you are is basically like what they name they name you. So um, my name is, my full name is actually Alma Nike. Okay. And so people call me Nike. So it's Alma Nike, and it means a child who is loved uh, uh, or a child who is adored and cherished. And oh, um, thank you. So yeah, it really is. my dad saw in me, um, I was just talking to my husband about this. Like my dad must have seen that I would need that. Because there are times where, like, I didn't feel like I was loved or cherished, you know, um, you know, just by people in my life. You just right. feel, you know, um, people forgot about you or whatever. So um, just I hold on to my name. Like, you know, he saw that in me. He saw that, you know, I'm a wow. person who people love, who people cherish. And, you know, so names hold very important meanings, like in, in the Nigerian culture. Yes. And so that's that's where, you know, the name comes from comes from uh Beautiful. and his full name full name is Amanike. short version is Nike Nike is a very common um nickname uh for Nigerian women as well oh. so tell me what's on your bookshelf right now uh what's on my bookshelf currently psycho cybernetics <laughs> is <laughs> what, what I'm you? into <laughs> yeah <laughs> is what I'm reading right now is what I'm reading right now, um, currently, when I can. So I have a lot of dentist appointments coming up because I have a lot of dental work. So <laughs> I've been taking that book. I've been taking that book with me, but um, I've been enjoying that so far. I learned about the psychology of success. What have you learned from your kids or what memory have you created in this last week? Uh, in this last week? Well, we just came from Charlotte, um, North Carolina. We visited my siblings there. Of course, I said I said we celebrate my birthday, and um, we've done some pretty fun things. So you know, I'm not one to celebrate my birthday or make a big deal about it. But you know, this year, my husband and my siblings wanted to get together. They wanted to create this, you know, weekend surprise of events thing. So oh, nice. um, we did some kayaking on the river, and that was fun because. I love water. I love the lake, river, the beach. That was a new experience for me. And, you know, while we were doing it, I was like, so guys, you know, we're creating new neurological pathways, you know, <laughs> the new experience. Classic. Kids love it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was fun. And, you know, my kids really loved that and enjoyed that. So that's definitely something we'll be doing again. Just that memory of just doing something new together as a family and, and yeah. um, creating that memory you know with all my siblings and their children and my husband and it was just a really amazing time beautiful I've got so many things written down that I want to ask you about and I can't fit into this time and I would really love to have you back to chat about like this many things I've got so many things written down <laughs> here thank you so much for joining me today and chatting with me about your homeschool your homeschool experience and how you're taking care of you thank you for having me I appreciate it it was fun good talk. And thank you for joining me today. I would love to learn more about who you are. So come on over to the Homeschool Mama support group on Facebook or the Homeschool Mama self-care Instagram page so we can support and encourage each other in our homeschool challenges. While you're there, you can check out the book of homeschool encouragement, Homeschool Mama self-care, nurturing the nurturer. If you're a homeschool mama looking for extra support, know that I'm about to release the Homeschool Mama Retreat, and I'm hoping that it will bring that sense of energy and inspiration and encouragement that only a retreat, though virtually, can bring to you. So I'll keep you posted on that. Join the mailing list to learn more about that when it releases. You'll find the show notes and links to everything you've heard today on www.capturingthecharmlife.com. Please subscribe to this podcast and share a review because when you review the podcast, you help other homeschool mamas learn about 
Homeschool Mama self-care. Until next time, I wish you and your kids a charmed week. Unless you're having one of those weeks, then I hope you can turn all your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms.